Good morning, folks. I am Terry Hawley with Terracon Consultants, and I am privileged to be moderating this session. Uh, we have David Levy with Baird Holm, and we have Patrick Waldron with the Nebraska Department of Revenue talking about measuring the benefits of renewable energy development. Um, if you got cell phones, please put them on silent so it doesn't disturb the program. Uh, if you need continuing education credits, uh, I believe there's a, a sign-in sheet uh, that you can fill out. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to start with uh, Mr. Levy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Levy. I'm a partner and uh, head up the energy practice at the Baird Home Law Firm in Omaha and Lincoln. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about the benefits of renewable energy. Um, in looking at my presentation, I realized I violated the cardinal rule. There's way too much text on these slides. So I apologize for that in advance. The good news, however, is what I'm going to talk about today is in a report that we have prepared in our office. And we have cards at our booth in the exhibitor space that have a QR code on them. And if you know how to use a QR code, but, and hopefully better than I do, you can use that to download a copy of that report, and you'll have the whole thing in front of you. So I'm pretty proud of our high-tech, uh, paper-saving uh, production of the report. It's a great report. We did this about 10 years ago, and it was certainly time to update it. So uh, pleasure to be able to present our findings to you this morning. One thing that I've got an article here in front of me hot off the press from a couple days ago did not make it into the PowerPoint, but this is from Nebraska Public Media, and the headline is, Nebraska added 750 clean energy jobs in 2022. Nebraska clean energy jobs grew by 4% in 2022, according to an analysis of, energy, of employment data by two environmental firms. The industry now employs nearly 20,000 workers in Nebraska. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's an industry that, uh, at least in its current form, certainly didn't exist in the state 15 years ago. So that's a lot of jobs. I don't know what the total employment in Nebraska is, but uh, that, that's a material number, so that's exciting. So let me get into the, the heavy text slides here. Uh, wind and solar en energy development provides property tax relief uh, by substantially increasing the tax base without increasing burdens on government. And I think that second part is really important. Wind turbines don't go to school, right? They, they don't uh, use hospitals. When they use roads, the road improvements are paid for by the developers. So the, this tax revenue that I'm going to talk about or talking about today is really almost all net new property tax revenue to counties. Renewable energy developers pay two forms of property tax in Nebraska a flat statutory excise tax of $3,518 per megawatt uh, on the facility's nameplate capacity, and that's paid over the life of the facility, uh, and then also an ad valorem property tax on real property improvements and leasehold interests. Uh, so the real property improvements are essentially the foundations, the roads, the operation and maintenance building. Uh, the wind turbine itself is actually considered personal property by the IRS in theory, uh, you could take it apart and move it and put it up somewhere else. Same thing with solar panels. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, we use a rule of thumb of about $5,000 per megawatt for the total of those two components for wind turbines because mostly the difference is the foundation uh, is a real property asset, and so those are quite expensive and create that additional uh, tax value or valuation. Uh, solar facility, we, we use a rule of thumb of about $4,000 annually. I will say we used to use a number of $6,000 for wind turbines, and that was based on the first project in the state in uh, Knox County, and, and that was from actual data from that project. As other projects have come online in other counties, and counties in the legislature have uh, reduced property taxes over that decade or so, 15 years since that project went online, we've seen lower numbers. So we've revised our rule of thumb uh, for wind turbines down to that 5,000 or wind projects down to that 5,000 per megawatt. Um, solar, we don't have a utility scale solar project yet operating in the state. Um, there's one uh, getting toward its final stages of construction in uh, Saunders County. And so I will be interested to see how our rule of thumb uh, holds up against that actual project. I think it's fairly accurate. Um, but it might be a little bit low. 
Uh, in fact, because as a, you see there on the slide, one of the real property items that's taxed is the leasehold interest. And solar leases are more expensive, uh, or they pay more than wind leases because the solar project uses all of the land, whereas a wind project, you can still farm right up to the turbines. So uh, 5,000 has, has borne out. I've seen numbers a tiny bit lower than that. I've seen numbers quite a bit higher than that. The 4,000 is our estimate, but um, it, it'll be interesting to see. So just taking those and, and kind of making easy math, a 200 megawatt wind facility would generate approximately a million dollars in new property tax revenue. Uh, in some counties, this new revenue can mean an increase in revenues to the county of over 20%. I actually did this calculation for one of the very small, uh, sparsely populated counties out kind of in the panhandle, uh, and that number increased from a 200 megawatt wind project was 40%. That county's property tax revenues, if they had one single 200 megawatt project, wind project, they would see their property tax revenues go up by about 40%. And their tax burdens, their costs of, of public services would, would go up very little. Renewable energy developers, of course, also provide direct lease payments, as I mentioned, to local landowners, attract businesses and create jobs, as I talked about from the article uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. So here's just one, one example um, of a county, uh, and you can see there the new revenues, and then um, that was an actual number of that, that county's tax revenue that they were receiving. You had the, the 200 megawatt wind project, and in this example, you've increased revenues by 21%. Again, that's a very material number for that county. I've had people who aren't big fans of renewable energy say, well, you know, a million dollars, that's, that's nothing. Doesn't move the needle, drop in the bucket. Not for that county, right? And counties, rural counties in Nebraska don't come by this kind of new revenue very often or very easily. These are really significant opportunities uh, to address one of the most serious problems that our local governments face across the state. Again, really just kind of saying what I just said here, but you know, the increased tax base, and, and we've seen this work frankly both ways. You'll also hear people say, well, that county board, they'll just, they'll just spend that additional money. We won't see any of it. And I have seen that happen, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If you're replacing a jail or you're improving your roads, your, your, your schools are improving. Um, and I'll go through here in a minute. The tax revenue gets divided up, of course, in the same way as property tax gets divided among the, the taxing jurisdictions. So about two-thirds of these revenues go to the school districts. Uh, about 20%, usually 25% go to the county itself, and then the rest goes to the other taxing entities. But I have also seen counties that uh, have a wind energy project go operational, reduce their tax levy in subsequent years because of that additional revenue. That's a, also a tremendous benefit, and of course something that the legislature and, and county commissioners and county supervisors work hard on uh, all the time. Very difficult problem, and this is uh, one uh, important solution. Again, sorry, apologize for the, the amount of text on this, but I think it, it's interesting. Many of you may know this. Uh, when that first wind energy project came online in Knox County, there was a realization that because most of it was personal property that's depreciable, tangible personal property, like, like any kind of business property, that there would be a giant tax payment at the beginning, and after about eight years, that personal property tax would go to zero. That was bad for the county because they'd get a bunch of money and then they wouldn't have a sustainable revenue stream. Um, in, in that county, they wanted to build a new community center and they weren't sure then how would they would maintain it, keep it up, all of that, if that revenue went to zero. Also not good for the developer, right? You've just spent a couple hundred million dollars building this project. You haven't sold a kilowatt hour yet. Uh, you're not receiving any revenues and now you have this giant tax payment as well. And so a group of people, I was part of that group, uh, the Association of County Officials was part of that group, the Natural Resources Committee, Revenue Committee, and the legislature got together. And in 2010, uh, the legislature passed the nameplate capacity tax. And what they did, they come up with the 3,518, they hired an economist from the university who looked at tax rates all around the state and looked at the value of the personal property in a wind project and basically said, okay, over the estimated 
life of a wind project, which he found to be 28 years, how much would that project pay in personal property tax? And then he backed that out to per year per megawatt. So that 3,518 at that time was a pretty good estimate of what that project would pay in personal property tax. Except though, uh, if a, a wind project, and often they do, goes on for 35 or 40 years, the nameplate capacity tax goes on with it. So after that 28 year estimated life, it actually, I've got to do the pun, it's a windfall to the counties, right? Everybody awake out there? Okay, so, so that's where the 3,518 came into play. A few years ago, one of the uh, members of the legislature who's not a big fan of wind energy wanted to increase the nameplate capacity tax. And the Revenue Committee declined ultimately to advance that bill, but one of the points we made to them at that time was that the cost of a wind turbine had come down by 40 or 50 percent since uh, Dr. Thompson from the university did that calculation. And so actually, if the nameplate capacity tax were keeping up with the cost of things, the value of that personal property, it would be a much lower number today. So the benefit to the counties relatively, uh, the, the amount is steady, but in terms of how it relates to the project and the cost of that, that personal property, uh, it's actually improved over the years. So in 2021, Nebraska counties received over 8,350,000 in nameplate capacity tax revenue alone. Uh, as I mentioned before, that 3518 uh, is what, about 70% of that 5,000 total. So you can add another $2.5 million to that. So that's probably about $10 million uh, annually that wind energy projects are paying to counties and school districts and other taxing entities in the state of Nebraska. Again, in terms of the state's total tax revenues, that may not seem like a lot, but for those counties, that's a really big deal. So this, just talking about the real property tax part of it as well. Um, one thing that's important to mention here is this second bullet. One thing that the statute says is that the assessor in that county, when valuing the real property under and around the wind turbine is, is to ignore the presence of the wind turbine or the solar facility. So the farmer who has the wind turbine or the solar facility on his or her property, the value of their property in theory would go up because now they've got an income producing asset there, right? They're receiving a lease payment. But what the statute says is that the assessor is to ignore the presence of that facility there. So their, their property continues to be valued as agricultural property and valued in the same way as their neighbor's property that might not have a wind turbine or a solar facility. Um, so I, I think that's an important piece of that. You can see the flow of revenues there. Let's keep an eye on the time here. Teosa, I, I don't want to delve into, and I'm not one of the two people on the planet who understands the Teosa formula, so I won't get too deep into it, but um, the nameplate capacity tax, according to the Nebraska Supreme Court, is an excise tax. It's not a real property tax. And as such, it does not affect the school district's TEOSA calculation. The real property tax could, and you know, we, we hear that complaint from opponents, well, this tax revenue is, is ephemeral because it's just going to get zeroed out by a loss of TEOSA revenue. Well, again, the nameplate capacity tax doesn't affect the TEOSA revenue, period. That's not part of that calculation. The other 30%, in my view, is I'd rather have the tax revenue, no offense to the legislature or people, Department of Revenue, um, but I would rather have the tax revenue coming to my county than be relying on this state formula and the legislature to fill that gap, right? We, we see, if you read the newspaper, you know TEOSA goes up and down. Teosa could go away. I would rather have that revenue. And, and many counties, most counties are not equalized uh, either. So in many counties, it doesn't affect them at all. But the ones it does, I still think it's a benefit, even if it were a wash, which probably it's not. Um, but even if it were a wash, because that revenue is now guaranteed to that county, they're producing that revenue themselves, essentially, by having that facility there. So uh, I think still the biggest single renewable energy project in the state is the Grand Prairie Wind Project in Holt County. 
Uh, we had the pleasure of being uh, legal counsel on that project. I had the pleasure actually last night of having dinner with uh, the developer of that project, Patrick Dalseth, who may be out here somewhere, uh, and Mike Zertruski, who uh, led the landowner effort and the local community effort to bring that project to Holt County. And, and it was great to get together with them and, and great to get an update from Mike on that project. He said it's really been nothing but a positive uh, for Holt County. But that's a 400 megawatt wind project, as you can see there. And the actual number of just name plate capacity taxes you can see there in 2020 is just over 1.4 million. Uh, if you take our rule of thumb and you, you create the real property tax part of that, that's about $2 million of new revenue from that project every year that that project is operating to Holt County. Again, that's, that's a significant benefit to that county. Two thirds of that goes to their schools. Um, Amy Shane is the superintendent up there and, and she's got a great video segment that you can find on, on YouTube where she talks you know, very directly uh, about how that money has really benefited them there, how they were able to build schools without issuing debt. I mean, that's pretty incredible, right? That, that's not something that you see happen very often, if at all. Uh, and again, that's, that's a big deal for that county and, and all because of that wind farm. So it's kind of fun just to break this down and, and you know, we cheated here a little bit, right? This is the biggest project, so these numbers are, are bigger. Um, but, you know, per acre in the project, you can see the number there per county resident. That's uh, $138 of new revenue to the county uh, per, per resident, uh, just for the nameplate capacity tax. And then the total is almost $200 per resident of that county. So again, uh, when you think about it that way, again, a big deal. So landowner payments uh, as well. Landowner payments in leases usually are confidential, so we don't have as good a data or we're not able to share data as well. Uh, of that, but um, you can see some numbers there. This, these are numbers for, for wind, solar leases, uh, again, have higher rents, higher land payments. Um, but a, a real easy way to think about this is that, at least on a wind farm, the lease payment is going to probably be similar to that $5,000 a megawatt um, that I mentioned for the nameplate capacity. And, and of course, the recipients of those lease payments are gonna spend some of that money locally, that's gonna generate sales tax, that's gonna generate jobs, that's gonna generate uh, spin-off economic activity, uh, and again, a great benefit for, for these counties and the county residents. Um, you can see here, talking about spin-off spin benefits, 2019, Google built a $600 million data center in Papillion, created about 120 uh, jobs and, and major, major tax revenue. Um, there's the Facebook facility, of course, in Sarpy County that many people are familiar with. Uh, and then I know the next session is about hydrogen, right? The hot topic of this year, I think, along with energy storage. Uh, it's fun. I've been coming to these conferences since the beginning. And in the beginning, we talked about wind, and then we started talking about solar. And now we're going to have to rename it the uh, Wind, Solar, Storage, and Hydrogen Conference, maybe. Um, so, uh, you know, again, really exciting stuff. And, and clean hydrogen, uh, tremendous opportunity. We're working on a project. I was just working up some numbers on the tax benefits of that project. And the property tax benefits from the hydrogen project itself are significant. And then you add a renewable energy project onto that. Uh, and again, you're, you are absolutely talking real money. Uh, hydrogen, of course, can be used to, pr uh, uh, to make ammonia fertilizer. Uh, which creates a competitive advantage for farmers in Nebraska. They don't have to buy that fertilizer from far away like they do now and pay transportation costs. They'll be able to buy that locally produced fertilizer uh, and, and obtain that competitive advantage as well. More to come on hydrogen for sure. Um, so the N National Renewable Energy Lab uh, has a, a model, an economic model, uh, that you can find online and it takes various assumptions and, and works up kind of the total economic benefit with all the spinoff benefits and all of that. And you can see there the, the headline, a 200 megawatt wind energy project could add over $180 million of value to a local economy over its life cycle. In any, any economy, that's a, that's a lot of money. Um, but again, you think about rural Nebraska, a smaller county that's struggling for revenues 
struggling to, to pay teachers and, and improve its schools and its roads. Uh, that's a big deal. All right, that's the end of my presentation. I will be here for questions. I'll turn it over to Pat, and then uh, we'll take your questions. I think we've got about 20 minutes left, so we should have some good time for Q&A. Thank you. You know, I'm Pat Walter with the Department of Revenue. And uh, you know, David had a lot of great information that I'm not going to duplicate, so mine's going to be pretty brief. So good for you and good for me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to talk after this, but <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, so the state does administer the nameplate capacity tax on behalf of the counties. And again, the tax, the, the nameplate tax is only for the personal property portion of the facility and not the real property, as David mentioned. Um, the program was initially in our policy department and greater revenue, and that moved to property assessment in 2019. And that's when I got involved with it. Um, so just again, at a high level, so each of the facilities is required to send in an annual reporting form called the 424 AR by the um, 1st of March of each year. And once that's received, uh, the staff takes a look at it, just confirms its accuracy. And then we email out a tax statement that goes out to the facility and that's called our 424 R form. And then <clears throat> if all, all goes well, then the payments um, will be coming in. Uh, they're due April 1st. They can be paid in full, or you can break it down into quarterly payments um, starting April 1st and every three months thereafter. And so then when the payments do come in to the state, um, the money is then dispersed within 30 days by statute, and that just goes all right back out to the county. And again, that's a, again, that's a very high-level process of the nameplate capacity tax. So um, we're going to open it up for questions here. I'll take softball questions, hardball questions, go to the revenue attorneys over here. So. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. I, I will say if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to stand and speak loudly because we have a big room here and not everybody can hear in the different corners. So I believe we have a question over here. If we got a microphone, that would be great. Yeah, I'm just interested in understanding how much the benefits are impacted by the ownership structure. Does the nameplate tax change if it's owned by public power versus a private company. And then I'm also curious, and I don't know if, if this is, is how, how much does the benefit change if, if the project is built in Iowa or Kansas? Are, are these pretty 5,000 per megawatt, the solar, are we all kind of on the same page here? Or are there some states that are extracting more or less benefits than others? Sorry about that, two questions though. <laughs> So as far as your question about like uh, NPPD, those are exempt. Um, there are some exemptions for uh, government entities. So they're not gonna be charged the nameplate capacity tax. That's uh, considered a public purpose, so they're exempt. Um, as far as the ownership, if it's sole proprietor or whatever, the nameplate capacity tax stays, stays the same for everybody. So just to add on to that, and, and I agree, I mean, the statute says that if the project is owned by a public power district, uh, it's not subject to the nameplate capacity tax. They're also exempt from the real property tax. They do pay real property tax under a whole different formula. Um, and it's a good question because now with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, creating the direct pay benefit that allows uh, a tax exempt entity to um, receive and, and receive the benefits of the tax credits, um, which they hadn't been able to do before that. Now you're seeing interest from our public power districts to uh, in owning renewable energy projects. Uh, I know OPPD has has purchased the rights to a solar facility, for example, example in York County. Um, and right now, as, as we're in the midst of permitting a number of these projects, um, county boards are saying to us, well, what what happens? if you sell this to a tax exempt entity, does this tax revenue go away? And so it, it's a, just being very direct and it's a, it's a current challenge. Uh, it's something we're working on because as I talked about, and as we know, those, those uh, tax revenues are very, very important to those counties, very beneficial to the school districts and all of the taxing entities. And we don't wanna lose that. And so we just need to figure out a way legally and, and economically that makes sense in those transactions, if a private developer 
develops the project, at least, uh, you know, there are different models for how you might transact it with the tax exempt entity. But if a private developer is involved and, and somehow then sells the rights of, to that project to a tax exempt entity, um, we just, we need to figure out a mechanism as to how we deal with that and, and kind of keep the counties whole. Um, it's not something we've landed on. We've come up with three or four different options. Um, and it's not something that has, um, actually transpired yet. Um, so it's one of those interesting things in this industry as it evolves that, that we'll see exactly how it works out. Um, so great question. In terms of other states, we do work in Iowa and, and Kansas, and they have totally different um, tax formulas uh, for renewable energy taxation. Um, I would say it's hard, it's really hard to compare because the formulas are so different. And, and in many cases, they also involve negotiation with the particular developer and the particular county. Um, but from what I have seen, um, we're all in the same ballpark. I would say that uh, I haven't seen one that's dramatically different from from one state to another. David, how's the money allocated to school districts? Is it, would it be the same as any other property tax? But this is an excise tax, but within a particular school district. That's that's also a good question. You guys, these I thought these were hard ones were supposed to go to the Department of Revenue attorneys. <laughs> um, so a couple of things, and, and I, Pat may have mentioned this, but if not, I want I did want to emphasize it. As he said, the nameplate capacity tax is paid to the state. The Department of Revenue is responsible to collect that money and then disperse it back out. It is dispersed ultimately out by statute to the taxing entities in exactly the same proportions as real property tax revenue. So if in that county, the school district gets 62% of the of real property tax revenue, uh, they get 62% of the nameplate capacity tax. If the county gets 21%, they get 21% of the nameplate capacity tax. In terms of projects, wind or solar projects that might span multiple school districts, uh, the taxation depends on the location of those assets. So if you have a wind energy project that let's say is two thirds in one school district and one third in another school district, the tax revenue will flow ultimately in that same proportion. Now the school districts might have different levy rates and you know you go parcel by parcel and there's different combinations of taxing entities. So the proportions might not be exact as I just described, but the, the taxation is, is by the location of the asset. And you know, again, I'm giving you a hard time about a hard question, but it's, it's another one of those great points because you do see situations where a project might all be in one school district and the school ne district next door is kind of going, hey, what about us? Um, and that's not something that we've ever dealt with. I know that I've talked to state senators before about potentially changing the formula somehow, and I can see pros and cons with that. Um, but it is another thing that, that can be a challenge in the industry and, and you know, project by project, uh, you try and deal with it as best you can and, and be fair to everybody. Just, just to comment on that, for the locale that would embrace the project, it means that the property tax reduction in that school district is gonna be even greater than the numbers you were citing earlier, but, you know, for the percentage reduction for the county. So right. it really does provide a even more substantial benefit yeah, and, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's real money every year. We were talking to a school district where there's now a project under construction, uh, and it was kind of funny. Um, they were giving us kind of a hard time, and, and what we realized is one of the things on their agenda was a pretty significant capital improvement project, uh, I think, to their high school. And the money that that renewable energy project was going to pay them in year one was almost exactly the same amount of money as that capital improvement project that they just approved, uh, you know, earlier in their board meeting. So it was sort of like, you know, it, it, it made the point really well. I thought. Do you give the same uh, presentation? At, is there is there a state meeting of county commissioners or county boards, and what's the receptiveness or like the status of those kind of conversations? Oh boy. Uh, that one's for the revenue attorneys too. <laughs> um, there is uh, the Nebraska Association of County Officials uh, is the statewide organization, at least in Nebraska. I know there's a similar organization in Iowa, and probably in most states. Um, and I have been on panels at those meetings before. One of their meetings, I think it's in the summer, is 
just uh, elected officials from counties. Um, and so certainly we talked about the tax revenues. Um, I would say the status of those conversations varies by uh, from official to official uh, and county to county. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, I understand people have different opinions on renewable energy, but the numbers that we've talked about here today are, those are real numbers. I mean, those are, uh, that's empirical data that's being, that's money that's being paid to counties and school districts, NRDs, fire districts uh, every year in the state. Uh, and it, it seems like it ought to be hard to argue with that. Um, I always say, you know, if you're opposed, I probably shouldn't say this in a setting like this, but it never stops me. Um, if you're opposed to a renewable energy project in your county, then you probably shouldn't be complaining about your property taxes. Please give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much.